Okay, let us now move on to electronegativity, polarity, and dipole. Now, this is something that students get very, very stressed with. Essentially what happens is, is that when you've got a, um, a atom that is electronegative, and that is an element that really, really wants electrons, it will try and steal those electrons from a, uh, a, a different element, but it won't want to give them back. It's sort of, I guess you'd say it's hunger or it's urge to keep those electrons is stronger than the other element. And in, as a result, it will sort of hold on to them for a little bit longer before it will reluctantly pass them on. So a good example of this is if we look at, again, we look at water. Now, oxygen is very, very electronegative. Okay. The, the trend for electronegativity is left to right, bottom to top where fluoride is the most electronegative element on the periodic table. So how could, do I know, just by looking at this, that we have a polar substance? What we do is we can see that oxygen here, and again, we can look at our periodic table, oxygen has six valence electrons. So it needs to steal two electrons to become stable. Now, that is oxygen in its neutral state. So as it tries to steal these electrons, it will get more negative. So let's say if it steals two electrons, you would refer to that as being negative two, because as it gains those electrons, it gets more negative. However, when it comes to polarity, we cannot give it a formal charge. So we cannot say you are negative one, negative two, because it hasn't actually taken one of those electrons. It just holds on to it for a little bit longer. So what we do is with that is that we denote it by a symbol delta. So if you see a lowercase delta like this, it means slight changing. Now, hydrogen is in an interesting position because it needs two electrons to become stable. So hydrogen only has one. So really hydrogen could lose an electron or gain an electron and it will become stable. So it's in one of those positions similar to carbon where it doesn't really matter if it steals or donates because it's, it's much of a muchness. He's right in the middle. Oxygen, on the other hand, desperately wants electrons. So a good way of thinking, uh, covalent bonds, thinking about polarity is when we've got a covalent bond, so we'll use chloride again as an example, is picture that in, as they're passing those electrons back and forth, it is like they're uh, throwing a tennis ball to each other. So they'll sort of throw a tennis ball and then the other element will throw it back and then I'll throw it and then they'll throw it back. And that pattern will go on backwards and forwards. And that is that sharing of electrons that we see during a covalent bond, which is here. Now let's picture that uh, I'm going to be oxygen. So I'm really, really, really want that tennis ball. And I'm going to be a bit greedy because as I throw the tennis ball to you, so it goes to you and you very kindly throw it straight back to me. But I'm sort of going to catch that ball and I'm going to sort of hold on to it for a bit. I'm not going to really want to throw it back until eventually I say, okay, I'll throw it back. Then I sort of hang on to it for a little bit longer. Then I throw it back. So you can see that sort of trend where you throw the tennis ball straight back to me, but I sort of catch it and I sort of dawdle a bit. I hang on to it. Then I throw it back. That in a, nest, in, in a nutshell is polarity. And that is where I hold on to those electrons a little bit longer than you did. Or in the case of water, oxygen holds onto those electrons a little bit longer than hydrogen. So in this case, we would denote oxygen as delta negative, because remembering that electrons are negative in charge, and these hydrogens down here would be delta positive, because they're not getting those electrons as much as they should. Now, this attractive force, so this force for an atom that wants to hold on to that electron a little bit longer, then pass it on, is denoted as electronegativity. So again, as you move from left to right on the periodic table and bottom to top, 
the electronegativity will increase. Now, here's a question I want you guys to answer for me. So I want you to pause and I want you to try and answer this. Why is it that fluorine is more electronegative than neon? So we can see that neon is further right on the periodic table. So why is it that fluoride is more electronegative? So pause, have a go, and resume in a moment. So the answer is that neon is a noble gas. So because neon has its outermost shell completely filled, it's not electronegative at all because it doesn't want those electrons. It doesn't want to try and steal them because it already has its outermost shell completely filled. Now here too is another sort of a, a visual example if you're still struggling to, to picture it. Um, are the different bonds in terms of electronegativity and polarity. So if we had our diatomic molecule chloride, is this polar or nonpolar? So I want you to pause and write down your answer. The answer is nonpolar because remembering that our polarity is one element favoring the electrons more than the other. Another way you can picture it too, instead of using a tennis ball, is to picture a tug of war. So if we have two people playing tug of war and one person is stronger than the other, they're going to pull the rope towards themselves. So if we look at our diatomic molecule example over here, the chloride atoms are exactly the same. They are identical in every way. So it's impossible for one chloride atom to be stronger than the other chloride atom because it just doesn't make sense. They're the exact same thing. It's like me saying uh, if we were playing tug of war with a, a Toyota Yaris on one side and a Toyota Yaris on the other. They're the exact same car. They have the exact same strength. So when they go to try and pull and play tug of war, no one's going to win. It's going to be a stalemate. And that is what we see here. So that is why Cl2 is nonpolar. So let us look further in depth at polar versus nonpolar. So typically a molecule will be polar if it has hydrogen connected to fluoride, oxygen, or nitrogen, mainly because these are one of the most electronegative substances that, that, are, uh, that exist on the periodic table. Another thing too to be aware of is if the central atom contains lone pair of electrons. So this is a, the example where water comes into play. So when we looked at water, that oxygen atom, it has lone pairs of electrons. If I draw water, it has these two lone pairs of electrons sitting up here because it only used one of its electrons here and one here. So the fact that if a central atom contains lone pairs of electrons, there is a very, very good chance that it is polar. Polarity, as I said before, also depends on the geometry. Now I'm going to explain that a little bit more in a moment, but if it's a tug of war, but they're arranged in a way that they will cancel each other out, it is non-polar. So let's look at an example here of carbon dioxide. So um, just to sort of speed things up a little bit, I'm just going to draw the structure for you. So I want you to pause and I want you to tell me, is carbon dioxide polar or nonpolar? The answer is nonpolar. And here is why. I know a lot of you may be sitting back there thinking, oh, but hang on, we just said before that, you know, oxygens are electronegative. They want to steal those electrons. So so, so why would it not be polar? Now, the answer is, yes, you are right in that these oxygens here and here are stealing electrons from carbon. So this electron is being greedy and wanting to pull electrons from carbon towards itself. And this, electro uh, sorry, and this oxygen is being greedy and wants to pull electrons over here. But if we have a look at our symmetry, it is the exact same example that I said before of tug of war between two Yarises, in that they are both pulling those electrons away from the carbon at the exact same force. Because this oxygen is the same as this oxygen, 
these double bonds are the exact same as these double bonds, and this is just one carbon. So there can't be a polarity, there can't be favoritism towards one side of the overall molecule because they're both pulling the carbon at the exact same force and um, stealing the electrons equally. So because it's stealing it equally, it is non-polar. Now let us look at a, a very well-known model and, and law in chemistry, and that is VESPA. So VESPA represents valence shell electron pair repulsion. Now what that is, is that's a big complicated way of saying that electrons hate each other. They absolutely hate each other. They do not want to be anywhere near each other. Picture, if you will, getting two magnets together and putting the same pole end together. It's going to want to repel and flick itself away. So it is, it is this same sort of behavior that we see in electrons as well. Now, when you are using VESPA to determine the overall shape of a molecule, it is highly advised that you draw the Lewis structure first. This is where a lot of students go wrong, in that they sort of try to look at a, a, a chemical formula and they'll just try and jump straight to the VESPA and go, oh, it's this shape, before they try and draw out the Lewis structure first. And more often than not, they get it wrong. So when you're doing VESPA, when you're trying to determine the shape of a compound, what it looks like in real life 3D, always make sure you draw the Lewis structure first. Cannot emphasize that enough. So let us look now at drawing a, a chemical in real life. So this is how it would, it would look. It's not all 2D. Let's now draw it in its 3D structure. So the first thing we would do is we draw the Lewis structure. Because when it comes to the structure, when it comes to finding these chemical bonds, the electrons are everything. That is what determines how it will look like, where these electrons are moving, and how they're bound together. So once we've done that, we can then determine the number of bonds. So how many times has one element bound to another element? Or how many elements is your central atom bound to? Another thing too, and this is a big, big, big thing that students forget all the time, lone pairs. Lone pairs of electrons count. You need to include lone pairs. If you forget them, you will draw the wrong structure every single time. Okay, so big, big, big thing there is make sure you take into account lone pair of electrons. Then, once you've done these two things, you can determine the, the overall structure by looking at the position of these atoms. So, let us look at an example. We'll look at methane. So, we draw our central atom, which is carbon. So carbon, if we look on the periodic table, has four valence electrons. So now carbon is bound to four different, uh, four different atoms. It has four different hydrogens. So we've drawn our Lewis structure. We now quickly check to make sure all the elements are happy. So hydrogen, one, two electrons, yes. Hydrogen, one, two electrons, yes. This hydrogen, one, two, yes, and this hydrogen, one, two. Carbon in the middle, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons, carbon is happy. So that tells us that we have uh, correctly drawn our Lewis structure. Uh, now the next thing we need to do is we need to determine the number of bonds. So how many bonds are there? We have one, two, three, four different bonds. Now, we look at lone pairs. Are there any lone pairs of electrons in methane? The answer is no. We don't have any lone pairs, so we don't need to worry about that. This is where a lot of people also get into, get into trouble. They sort of go, okay, I've drawn the structure out now. That's how it looks like. And the answer is no. And we can see why. So if we look here in its very much 2D structure, the gap between the electrons here and the electrons here is only a 90 degree. 
Now, electrons absolutely hate each other. They want to push each other away as far as possible. So what will happen is that's not good enough. How it will be, um, how it will look is this. So we sort of have a pyramid at the bottom here. So we have one pointing down, one pointing out, and one pointing in, and we have one pointing directly up. And what that gives us is not a bond angle of 90 degrees, but a bond angle of 109.5 degrees. And this one is the correct answer. So these are the different uh, molecular structure that we can see based on how many bonds a particular element has. So uh, something I've, I negated to say is this is a tetrahedral shape. Okay, and we can see that here, tetrahedral, because tetra meaning four. So we know that if we have a, a compound that has four different bonds, it must be tetrahedral because it must be bound to four different things. If we look at our example of water, our water is bent, which we can see down here. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to pause this video because I want you to tell me why is it that the structure of carbon dioxide is linear in shape, so that's this one over here, whereas if we look at H2O, H2O is bent. So why is it that CO2 is linear and H2O is bent? The answer is these lone pairs of electrons. With carbon, it doesn't have any lone pairs of electrons up here to push these bonds of uh, connecting the carbon to oxygen up or down. So because those electrons have been stolen by oxygen, it has no electrons there to move things around. And that is why carbon dioxide is linear. Whereas if we look at water over here, if we have our oxygen, hydrogen, and hydrogen, the same problem as uh, we looked at before with methane over here, the same problem occurs in that instead of a bond angle of 109.5, if we were to draw it linear and have ox uh, water's lone pair of electrons there, the difference in the distance uh, or the, the angle between the lone pair and the covalent bond here, these electrons, is only 90 degrees. So they will push themselves up as far apart as possible. And that is why carbon dioxide is linear, whereas water is bent. Now, some things you need to take away from VESPA are, you must have all of the molecular structures, the names of them, memorized. You must know that we have bent, linear, trigonal planar, trigonal pyramidal. You must also know how many, uh, how many bonds or how many pairs of electrons are needed for each of these molecular structures. And you also must know the different bond angles. And that is that if we have trigonal planar, it is 120 degrees. Linear is 180. So all the rest, so whether it's, uh, you know, we've got tetrahedral or whether we've got trigonal pyramidal, they are all 109.5. So you must have that memorized. Not only will it help you in drawing them out, very, very easy multiple choice question. So make sure that you know the structures, what the names of those structures are, the different bond angles, and again, be able to draw VESPA from a Lewis structure. Okay, very easy exam questions. Okay guys, so that is the end of module five, video one. Thank you very much again for joining me. I hope you took away a lot from this. Um, if you do have any questions, queries, suggestions, anything like that, please feel free to hit me up on my email at b.grant at griffith.edu.au. Um, also, if you could all please complete the survey, it's in the description underneath this video. That would be fantastic as that gives me a lot of feedback towards these videos 
It lets me know whether you're enjoying this as a resource and lets me know how I can constantly improve these videos to make sure that you guys enjoy and take as much away from chemistry as you can. So my name is Brock Grant. Thank you very much for joining me and I'll see you next time.